I try not to think about is it possible or not. I try to think about what is the right thing to do. Welcome to Acton Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. In this episode, we're bringing you one of the plenary lectures from Acton University 2023, titled Shining a Light on the Darkest Place in the World by North Korean defector and human rights activist Yeonmi Park. Born in North Korea, Park grew up in a punishing society devoted to the worship of Kim Jong-il. But at the age of 13, she and her family made a daring escape in search of a life free of tyranny. In her viral talks, viewed online nearly 350 million times, Park urges audiences to recognize and resist the oppression that exists in North Korea and around the world. In this lecture, Park sounds the alarm on the culture wars, identity politics, and authoritarian tendencies tearing America apart. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Born in North Korea, she's a human rights activist and TED speaker, grew up in a punishing society, but at the age of 13, she and her family made a daring escape across the North Korean border in search of a life free of tyranny. She chronicles this journey in her first book, In Order to Live, A North Korean Girl's Journey to Freedom. In her viral talks, viewed online nearly 350 million times, Park urges audiences to recognize and resist the oppression that exists in North Korea and around the world. The BBC has named her one of its top 100 global women. Her most recent book is While Time Remains, A North Korean Defector's Search for Freedom in America. Uh, both books are available in the AU bookstore. I encourage you to check them out there. Uh, I learned at dinner that, of course, while uh, I, I grew up across the river from St. Louis, so uh, I've certainly not fled a place like North Korea, uh, but Yonmi and I do have something in common. We both fled Chicago. Uh, not nearly as an oppressive place as North Korea by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but certainly not the idyllic place that one thinks of when they think of the concept of freedom in America. Uh, I had the chance to hear Yomi speak in 2014 at the Atlas Network's uh, Liberty Forum in New York City. And again, for a guy that grew up across the river from St. Louis, who ran political campaigns, who worked for nonprofit organizations, um, it, it's amazing to hear the stories of people like you and me, the people who are at conferences like Atlas and like Acton University, uh, who while, you know, I ran political campaigns in Illinois, we have our fair share of corruption and problems, not on the order of anything like people like Yeonmi have had to deal with in a place like North Korea. Her story is incredible. It's remarkable. It's an absolute privilege to be able to introduce to you this evening Yeonmi Park. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> wow. Oh, when I entered this room this evening, I felt so surreal because uh, when I was born in North Korea, I was literally born in the darkest part of the world. In the 21st century, not to even mention what internet is, we don't even have electricity. I have a lot of friends in New York who worship, you know, the no impact of the climate and dreams of a day there's no more climate change. I would offer them, why don't you go to North Korea? <laughs> because we have Earth Day every day. <laughs> and now here I am in the, literally across from the country that where I was born, standing here as a American bastard myself. <laughs> thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. When I was born in North Korea, 
uh, I had to go to school like everybody else. And literally, the first thing that I learned was how horrible American bastards were. And by the way, this was one word. If we just said Americans, that would be too respect, respectful. We would be get punished. Even in my math book, it was like this. There are four American bastards. You killed two of them. How many American bastards are left to kill? <laughs> I think it's thousands of us here today, right? <laughs> um, it's, today, I really want to talk about uh, my second book that I'm drawing of the similarities that I'm seeing in America and North Korea. And this is, I hope, I really people understand how North Korea began as a nation. Uh, in the 1940s, Kim Il-sung came to North Korean people and he prom promised us uh, this beautiful paradise. He promised us that there is no more poverty or rich people or inequality. He said, we are going to give you free health care. We are going to give you free education. We are going to give you free housing. And we are going to eliminate every kind of inequality, especially of the outcomes. For doing that, why don't you give us your private property, your land, your uh, freedom of speech, and freedom of movement? Innocently, my grandmother generation, they did that because they truly believed in equity. They thought nobody should be poor, nobody should be rich. They thought that was injustice, the inequality was injustice. Once they gave everything to the regime, Kim Il-sung simply took everything from us and did not give us anything back. Instead, he gave us the most unequal society in the face of humanity. North Koreans are like, unlike Americans, we are homogeneous, we have the same genetics, we speak the same language. We are one same Korea almost for 5,000 years. After Kim Il-sung took power, he divided North Koreans into 51 different classes. So there are too many classes, so let's simply they divide it into three big groups. And usually in North Korea it's a joke. The first group is what we call tomatoes. You are red inside, you are red outside. You are absolute perfect communist. Therefore, you are a royal group. The regime likes you. Second class is apple. You are red outside, but you are white inside. You are questionable. You need a surveillance from the regime. Third is a really screwed class. You are grape. You are not even red inside, all outside. You're a hostile class. Government gonna punish you throughout the generation. There's no redemption. There's no way of changing that status. I always say whenever I try to give a speech, I get nervous. And this thought of that, even if I say the wrong words standing here, that I'm not gonna be executed. But in North Korea, that's a reality. The very first thing that my mom taught me as a young girl was, don't even whisper, because the birds and mice could hear me. She said, if I said one wrong word, it was just not gonna kill me. It was going to kill up to three to eight generations of my family because of one wrong word. And does this remind you a little bit what's happening in America? What we can say, what we cannot say. People get canceled. People lose their jobs. By the way, this is how it starts. North Korea did not become that way. It was a gradual steps that regime took with us. And that's the end result when we start controlling the language and deciding what words is allowed to spoke and what words is not allowed to be spoken. Uh, by the time when I was 13 years old, I really could not find any food. But I was luckily living in the border town of North Korea called Hesan. And there were some smugglers that were smuggling foreign films through the North Korean black market system. And I got to watch the Hollywood film Titanic. As a teenage girl in North Korea watching Titanic, I was utterly confused. Because in North Korea, there is no Romeo and Juliet. 
There's no love stories. There's literally no word for love. Kim Jong-un recently banned Mother's Day because he was afraid that if we love our mothers, we are not going to love him as much. So love between human beings are denied in North Korea. I never heard from my parents that he loved me or my mom tells my father that she loved him. The, o- the only love when we were allowed to express was when we expressed our love for the dictator, Kim Jong-il. And in this movie, I saw a man dies for his lover. And that's when I got this glimpse of outside the world. And I decided to escape from my homeland. It was 2007 when I was 13 years old. And as you can see, I'm very small in, on my five inch high hairs. <laughs> uh, North Koreans are average actually five inch shorter than South Koreans because of malnutrition. And I wanted to go somewhere to find food. And that was China for me. Right before my escape, I wanted to escape with my own sister, but I couldn't go with her because I had a horrible stomach ache. So she escaped first and my parents took me to a hospital. And here again, we are living in a socialist paradise where healthcare is free. In North Korean hospital, the nurse uses one needle to inject every patient. They use beer bottles as a drops. And doctors would not treat you if you don't bribe them. That's what actual free healthcare looks like. Uh, this is the last thing I saw from my homeland. We don't have indoor bathroom, obviously, in North Korea. We had to go to outside. After my operation, that did not even have any proper anesthesia, I would go to bathroom and there were piles of human dead bodies scattered. And then I saw these little children were catching the rats who were eating humans. And rats eating our eyes first when we are dead because that's a soft tissue in our body. And my mother asked the nurse, like, why would you not take those bodies away? And she said, we don't have any gas to remove those bodies. And from there on, I knew that if I don't get out, that person was going to be who is going to be eaten by the rats. I crossed the frozen Yalu River into China with my mother initially. And first thing I saw in China was um, my mother being raped. Uh, so how many of you guys know about the one child policy that China has? A lot of you. What a stupid idea. Government thinks somehow it's a good idea to control how many children people can have. The result of that dumb idiot policy that CCP implemented was 33 million of lacking of women. There are surplus of 33, 33 million men in China cannot find wives because a lot of people were aborting girls and choosing to having a son because that's the only time they could have a child. And in these shoulders, they buy North Korean women as their sex slaves. They sold my mother um, for $65. And then they sold me over $200. Uh, I was more expensive than her because I was a child virgin. And some perverted Chinese men liked the child virginity. So they gave more money to buy me. But being raped is not the worst thing that can happen to North Korean women in China because there are four places that we end up. Number one place that we end up is to the organ harvesters. They buy us, they take our organs away, and they discard our bodies. Second body, second place they buy North Korean girls are the brothers. They put a girl in a room, there is even no windows, and give her the drug because it's so painful, and rape her until 500 times per day. They don't last more than six months. Third place that North Korean women end up in China is a, 
in the countryside of villagers. The men cannot afford to buy one woman, so the village men chip in, and they buy a one girl, and they wrote her to rape her until she dies. Luckily, I was bought by another human trafficker, and I didn't get to be gang raped. But I had to be his sex, sex toy for two years, from when I was 13 to 15. Two years of my slavery, uh, I finally had a chance to live life with dignity. There were South Korean Christian missionaries risking their lives, came to China, rescuing North Korean defectors. And these Christians told me that there was a way to be free and there is a way to get out of China. And this is the very first time I heard the word free. So I asked these missionaries, what do you mean that I'm going to be free? What does that even mean? And how would you explain a concept of freedom to North Korean? They did a perfect job. I was a teenage girl, and I was very interested in beauty. So she said, sweetie, if you go to South Korea, you can wear jeans, and you can watch K-dramas, <laughs> and they are not going to arrest you for that. And I thought, there is a world like that where human beings have a choice to choose their own pants and choose their own TV show because these are the things where North Koreans get to even execute it for watching a wrong film. Wearing a jean is a symbol of capitalism. They put you in a uh, work camp. And they said, in order for me to be free, I had to walk across frozen Gobi Desert into Mongolia from China in minus 40 degrees. Oh, so in 2009, I took that journey. I gave everything I had, and chances of making me surviving that night in the desert was not even 1%. So do you know how many North Korean defectors made it to America over the last 80 years? Just 109 of us made it to America over the last 80 years from North Korea. And I don't know what luck, what miracle that was. I survived that night. I survived the desert. And I was rescued by the Mongolian guards and sent to South Korea. And 80 years ago, I came to America. I came to America to study at Columbia University. Uh, you would think, this would be the end of my story, end of my journey to search for freedom. And when I came to America, I found a very interesting country. I thought this country was the land of opportunity, you know, the home of the brave, where the liberty bell rings, and where people understand that free discussion, the diversity of thoughts is an essential part of being living at the free country. And when I got to Colombia, my professors were exactly teaching the same bullshit that North Korean teachers were taught me in the same classroom. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Literally, in North Korea, they say, if we don't have electricity, they say, because of Amer American bastards and greedy capitalists. My Columbia professor was saying exactly the same thing. The all the problem in the world that exists today is because of Americans, the white men especially, and because of Western civilization, and because of capitalism. And the only solution to all these problems is dismantling American constitution and dismantling capitalist society that we are having here today. And they even to the point saying, Gender is a made up, it's a social construct. And I was thinking, even in North Korea, they didn't go this crazy. <laughs> at least, <laughs> at least in North Korea, we know what woman is. And in, North, in America, by saying that, now I'm a bigot. And then my professor was saying, even math and science is made up by white men to control minorities. 
And this was the same lesson I received from my North Korean teacher. My North Korean teacher one day asked me, Yomi, what is one plus one? I said two. And she said, you are wrong. My dear leader Kim Jong-il, when he was a child, discovered that if you add one drop of water to another drop of water, what does it become? It becomes bigger one. It does not become two. That's how he proved that math was made up by the West to control minority people. And this same thing is being taught in American Ivy League University. I'm a mother now, raising five-year-old beautiful child. And when I had him in Chicago, uh, the hospital, Northwestern Hospital, gave me his birth certificate. And in birth certificate, that father was born in the USA. He was half, he was a white guy. <laughs> and mother was a North Korean. And I was thinking, when North Korean women being raped in China and get pregnant and sent back to North Korea, they inject women's belly with salt water. They kick the woman's belly until baby dies. They don't believe in mixed race in North Korea. My son can only exist in freedom. Because if I didn't come to America, he would never exist. He would have gotten killed before he was born. And here I am fighting for my freedom again. And this time, I decide to not run again. Because if America goes down, where do I go, guys? We cannot escape to North Korea, obviously. There is really, really no place to go. And though this is where it really bothers me because tyranny always comes in a disguise with compassion. And people with good intentions believe this amazing story that, you know, they, I asked my Columbia classmates, why do you hate America so much? Why, what about capitalism you hate so much? Why they are in their purple hair, literally. Without capitalism, you think who's gonna make the purple hair dye in color for you? <laughs> literally, I mean, I came to America, I go to try to buy my toothpaste. I mean, there's mint scent, complete whitening. I mean, there are dozens of different types of toothpaste and hair dyeing. Only in capitalism you get that choice. And they said, I hate capitalism because there is inequality. Look outside. There are homeless people and there are billionaires. Therefore, capitalism is so evil that we need to destroy it. And to a North Korean for me, I was like, what do you mean you have a homeless? Like, you have a right not to work? In North Korea, you know, if you choose to become homeless, what happens to you? They put you in a prison camp. They rape you, they torture you, and they kill you eventually. You have the right not to work. That's like, that's a sign of tolerance. That's a sign of freedom. Inequality is not the enemy. Poverty is the enemy. And I hope all we can remember from North Korea example, when people by this idea where government can take care of us. They can take care of our health, our children, our education. Governments are just collection of selfish people, a lot of them. And it is up to us to take care of our lives. And I really, truly hope that we do not take the path that North Korean people chose to take. And we can keep America as what it was, what it used to be. So thank you so much, everyone. And we have a Q&A section after this. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We have a Q&A. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Please, thank you so much. <laughs> Yomi, thank you so much for sharing that story, um, harrowing story. Uh, we're so incredibly grateful that you're here to share it with us and you were able to escape um, a land of 
tyranny that I really think most of us in this country just can't fully imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and what caught me uh, as you were talking is that uh, what kind of opened your eyes to this is seeing Titanic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, but my first question is, how aware of culture like that, how available is something like that? How hard was it to be able to get a copy of a pirated film like Titanic to even be able to see? How aware of the culture of the rest of the world are North Koreans? Uh, so, I know that people know about this, me watching this Titanic story. Uh, so in North Korea, watching a foreign film is a death sentence. And especially if you give it to your friends. It's very hard. And actually recently, Kim Jong-un sentenced a two-year-old to a concentration camp because the parents of this toddler own the Bible. So it's very hard for North Korean people to know about the world. And I actually never even seen the map of the world. I did not know that even I was Asian. When I was in North Korea, my school teacher taught me that I was my Kim Il-sung race. Did you know that North Korea has a different calendar system? North Korea calendar begins when Kim Il-sung was born, what we call Zutte year. That's how I sort of we are in the country. We don't even know, you know, this is what shocks me when I came to America now. They think I'm a conservative and telling me I'm a racist. Like, I did not even know that what race was. <laughs> they cannot be I'm a racist at all. And like that, like, it's a, literally a different planet they are living in. Uh, so I want to remind people, as you see uh, the rotating slide up on the screen, uh, you can submit questions using the Slido app or going to slido.com. You can use the code AU2023. We're going to try to get through as many questions as we can in the uh, roughly 27 minutes that we have left to talk with you and me. Um, how is your family doing? Uh, they got or persecuted because I spoke out against the regime. So this is a thing that North Korea does to control people is something called guilt by association. And the root literally taking place in America. I have a son who is half white, and one of the daycare we want to stand him in New York City, uh, they invited some transgender person came, and then asking three years old, five years old on a podium to ask them, teach them about white gift. If your parents own their own homes, they stand out to really shame them about the privilege they're having. And like that, like now, my son, he needs to answer for the slavery that happened how many generations ago. Like that in North Korea is something called a guilty by association. If because you are simply associated to this person, you are guilty as well. And that's how they persecute all my family members through my mom's side and my dad's side. I have to imagine that weighs on you heavily. Uh, you know, the, the desire to seek freedom outside of North Korea, again, you know, it, it seems that that's a horrible regime, but effective probably at achieving what they want, is that people won't do anything that would put that many family members in jeopardy. That's why you don't see a lot of defectors speaking out. It's not like Cubans, Iranians, Venezuelans, they get out, they can speak out. Even though they, after they escape, they send assassins and kill the factors if they speak out. And like he killed his uh, brother in Malaysia, Kim Jong-nam, a few years ago. Like that, after even escape to freedom for North Koreans, it's not a, you're not safe even. Even afterwards, there are spies. And if you try to, discredit the regime, they send assassins and they try to kill you. So I've been on the killing list of the regime for a long time right now. A question from one of our audience members. Uh, in your darkest times, where did you find hope? Uh, do you have hope for your country today? To North Korea? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, to me, it's like, it's a 
being optimistic or pessimistic is a really irrelevant question because I know what's the right thing to do. That is fighting for these people. There are 300,000 North Korean women in China right now are trapped and under the modern day slavery. And I'm just a lucky one of them got out and made this far. So I try not to think about is it possible or not. I try to think about what is the right thing to do. And that helps me with even dealing with the current America. Because I see so many people are losing hope. Is, it, is the U.S. even salvageable? Can we, can we save our country? But to me, it's irrelevant. What is the right thing to do? We have to fight for freedom and our future. So that's what I'm focusing on every day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think that's a, a good dovetail into another question here from the audience, which is, uh, what can people do to support resistance to the North Korean regime? Uh, is there anything particular that people of faith can contribute to that? I, I think that's a, a drive for so many Americans who want to help. Uh, they, they, they hear stories like yours of what goes on in North Korea, what goes on in China, the story that we've told in our documentary about Jimmy Lai in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to help. Um, what's the most effective thing that Americans can do or people from anywhere can do uh, to resist the, the North Korean regime as it currently exists? So there are many ways to help the North Korean people. You can rescue them. Like there are missionaries that I currently work with. And uh, right now, so as I said, when North Korean women get sold in China, this one guy uh, buys these women in, a, in his own property and he impregnates them, rape them until they get pregnant. And then once the baby is born, he starts the baby. And these infants are sort of a poor industry. Uh, we don't even know where these babies go, but he does that, it's his own kid. And he's trying to rescue these babies right now. Uh, you can join his ministry and help these babies. But also, more the core problem why North Korea exists as it is, is because of China. I've been having really hard time to get mainstream media attention for this problem or the American politicians to pay attention to this. I mean, remember how Michelle Obama has no problem meeting girls who were captured by Taliban ISIS. American media Hollywood has no problem talking about the girls suffering in the Middle East. But when it comes to North Korean women, they don't want to talk about it because they have so much business interest with China. And that's the same thing with American politicians. They get so much support. And even Columbia University gets so much funding from China. So the accountability lays in CCP. North Korea cannot exist without CCP support. They cannot even maintain the power one week without Xi Jinping. So if we really want to liberate North Korean people, we have to demand China to stop committing this crime against humanity. Do you <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I want you to you know, vote for the right politician that are aware of the cynical side of Chinese go the government. What a harm they're causing to the humanity. And we can speak to our corporations in America, our colleagues, because they don't know that China is responsible for North Korean human rights crisis. Well, the, I'm curious about that. What, why do you think, do you think Americans just don't really understand the seriousness of the challenge that China presents. Um, is, we talk about this in the documentary as well, is one of the last notes that, uh, that we hit in the film, um, is about the willingness to do business in China and the compromises that people in the West are willing to make with awful totalitarian regimes. You know, in your experience being here in America, do did, did, did we just, uh, as Americans, just not take that seriously enough? I think, I think this is where I was very confused. When I came to America, I had a very different expectation of the world leaders. I thought they're going to be better than Kim Jong-un, obviously. <laughs> and I was... Low bar to clear. Right. <laughs> I was 
really confused. I came to the time when Obama was in the office. He would not sit down into one single North Korean defector. And even Biden currently, right, inviting uh, Dylan Mulvaney, like the transgender person, to come and talk about oppression they are facing. And they literally don't care about what's happening to Northern people. And especially North Korea is a, literally the United Nations, after their conducting study, they said what's happening to Northern people is a modern day Holocaust. Holocaust is repeating again. And the world is denying it again. And I was thinking they have the best intelligence. Why are they not doing anything about it? It is really comes down to that, I think, the leaders in America, they are also very selfish people, a lot of them. And they just thinking about their reelection and they're thinking about their lobbyists. And the, those lobbyists, of course, make so much money through the CCP. And they don't want American government to challenge the CCP in any way. So that's why North Korean issues always get like, you know, started away. And nobody can hear about this, and especially even Hollywood. My movie, uh, the first book, wanted to be adopted to a film. And then the Hollywood producer sent me a script. And in my script, it says, China was my promised land. When I got to China, Chinese authority gave me protection and gave me re refugee. Mm. And I asked this producer, this cannot be further from the truth than what happened. And he said, this is the only way we can make a movie about North Korea and current Hollywood. Because if the studios can make a movie about North Korea, but then China is going to drop in all that funding for other films. They cannot get funding for the future films. And that's when I said, I don't need to make that movie. So that theory is off now. And this is why there's no single movie came out about North Korea in anywhere in the mainstream media. You mentioned in your story that you encountered these uh, Christian missionaries. Mm. Did you know what Christianity was when you encountered these people? Was, you know, uh, what was your understanding um, and in general North Koreans' understanding of faith, religion, uh, Christianity, or otherwise? So in North Korea, we cannot believe in other religion. As, as I said, there's 120,000. So North Korea has many types of con the camps, and one type is a concentration camp where none of your generation ever going to come out. There are about 120,000 of inmates currently, and 70,000 of them are Christians. It's the number one most persecuted country for the Christian people. And this is what I learned later. So Kim Il-sung basically was raised in a Christian family in Pyongyang. And then when he became a dictator, he decided to become a god himself. And that's what the communism always do. They go after religion first, and the state becomes a god, right? They cannot compete with other gods. And then in, in North Korean, in doctrine is literally like the Bible. When I met these missionaries, they were trying to tell me about God and just Christ. I was confused, and this lady was telling me, like, hey, sweetie, don't worry about it. Think of God as Kim Il-sung, who loved us so much. He's the supernatural God. He gave us his son, Kim Jong-il. He dies for our sin. His body dies, but his spirit is with us all the time. That's how he knows what we are even thinking in our heads. And when we all die, we are joining him in a socialist paradise. So they copy the Bible. They even have their own Ten Commandments. So North Koreans don't know about the Bible or just like any Christianity, but very similar doctrine that North Korea created from Bible. A question from our audience. Uh, what is the biggest difference in your experience of mundane things, such as waking up in the morning between now and when you were growing up in North Korea? How, how is life different on existential level for you? <laughs> I mean, uh, first of all, if I wake up in North Korea, there will not be a central heating. I'll be, <laughs> there will be no mattress. There will be no shower. There is no bed sheets or like that. We'll be sleeping on a cement floor. Uh, there will be rats like swickering on the, our ceilings. We don't have those windows. We don't have air conditioning or heating like that. And once you wake up in North Korea, 
Every day is a survivor. That's why the regime is starving us. Do you know why North Korea is starving? It's not like Africa or Haiti, the natural disasters happen that we are poor. Regime conducts more than, uh, over the last three years, more than uh, something 60 missile tests over the last four years. Per missile test, he can feed 25 million North Koreans entire year. Nobody has died from starvation. If he took, like, did four less missile tests, the reason he keeps us starving is because that's, then we don't have time to think about meaning of life and freedom. Every single meal is a survivor in battle. If we make it today, we're gonna worry about how are we gonna make tomorrow. If we find the food for the breakfast, we're gonna worry about how are we gonna find dinner because we don't eat lunch in North Korea. And so just every day your energy is going into surviving. So former President Trump quite famously met, was the first American president to meet with a leader of North Korea when he met with uh, Kim Mm -hmm. Jong-un. There's a question from the audience that ties into that. What do you think when America engages in diplomacy with North Korea? How, How did you feel when you see the president of the United States and the leader of North Korea meeting in person? So nothing is black and white. At the time he was meeting Kim Jong-un, I was very offended. <laughs> I was, because I, I understand Trump. He's a businessman, he's not a politician. He thought he can make a deal with Kim Jong-un, like make him put his guard down, tell him that, you know, we are nice people, Americans are not trying to attack you. Open up your economy, get rid of your nukes, we're gonna help you build your economy up. But Kim Jong-un is a very logical politician. He was educated in Switzerland. Kim Jong-un knows how exactly human beings should be treated. He exactly knows how world should operate. And I thought Trump's intention was never gonna work because North Korea was afraid of Trump. Under Trump, they could not conduct any long-range missiles because Trump was like talking about how my nuclear button is bigger than yours, remember? <laughs> it's like, you know, calling him rocket man. So Kim Jong-un was really trying to buy time of Trump era because Americans is a democracy. They're not going to be in the office like him for the rest of his life. So as long as he's by this time, distract Trump, and then somebody weaker comes along like Biden, now North Korea fires missile every day. And Biden calls North Korea, he doesn't even pick up the phone. So that was his strategy. And I think that's when I was thought the intention was good. But it would be having a bit more effective diplomacy if Trump was really pressing on China on the part. That not just only going after tariffs and the treaties, but talking about North Korean issue as well with China. And there would be way more results coming out of that. I mentioned in the introduction that uh, you and I have both are former residents of the city of Chicago. Yeah. Um, at dinner, uh, Joni was telling me that um, your experience in Chicago was a major impetus for why you wanted to write this book. Yeah. Um, would you tell us about that experience in, in your time in Chicago and what motivated you to uh, write this book while time remains? Yeah, so when I was at Columbia, I thought it was just, you know, the, this work religion. It's at this point, it's a religion, right? Like, men can be women, men can be women. Like, if you repeat it 100,000 times, somehow it's going to happen. <laughs> like that. It's just, they just keep repeating it. They say, words are violence, words are violence. And they also say, silence is violence. And these old slogans are so, like, communist, you know, in doctrine. I thought they're gonna get over it. if they graduate from university, they go to the real world, raise their own family, start paying taxes, they're gonna understand how the world works. And one day I was robbed in Chicago during the BLM protest in the first year when George Floyd died. I was walking with my son uh, in the Mission Avenue in the afternoon, like, like before 4 p.m. during the bright day. A uh, few African-American women uh, takes my wallet and punches me. And beaten by these women in front of my son. And then people, I was trying to call the cops. Of course, I'm like being uh, robbed and being punched. And then people circled around me 
and calling me I'm a racist because I'm trying to call the cops on these thieves. And they said the skin, the person's skin color does not make them a thief. And like, here I am, I was raped by Asian men. When do I say color has to do anything? Anybody can be a rapist, anybody can be a murderer, anybody can be a thief. Nothing about it was a race. It was just simply just two human beings, happened to be African-American women, robbing me. And then I realized the madness of crowd. These people cannot be reason anymore. They lost the ability to think critically. They just simply see at the moment was my skin color because I'm an Asian woman. I cannot be a victim. And these people who are harming me, they have the color of a person who was a victim supposedly and who was supposed to be oppressed. So I'm the one who is guilty. And that's when I realized this, this ideology is so deep rooted than I thought. And we might be losing this country. So I wrote this book to really wake up American people. How many the similarities? It's in a way there's a dictator's handbook, right? They take the steps to get there. And I'm seeing those steps taken in America every single day. And some of the cities like Chicago and New York, way, way gone that path than here right now. But definitely we are in that direction. If we do not resist, we are going to keep going this direction. Did you see a parallel in the way that you just talked about, like, you know, the the way that mobs act, um, the way that they kind of get subsumed into one way of thinking. Did you see parallels between that and uh, the way people are in North Korea that, you know, that this, again, it's one way of thinking, um, part of this collective that doesn't allow for individual thought or expression in, in a meaningful way? Yeah, so this is, uh, to me, is very interesting because this being tribal way of Group think it's you know in a way it helps you at Colombia if you didn't find follow that doctrine you'd get like persecuted right it's so convenient to believe what the, everybody is saying then you are not the outsider but the danger of group thinking is you cannot think for yourself you cannot think critically so when I for instance when I went to South Korea the South Korean intelligence were telling me you know the Kim Jong Il he's not a god. He goes to bathroom, <laughs> and he doesn't starve. He is really well-fed, greedy dictator. And I was like, what? and he probably didn't shoot that uh, round of golf in the '40s either. Right. And I was like, what do you mean? Like I thought, like literally, Kim Jong Il, like me, was starving. That's what the regime told me that he was starving like us, or not sleeping. He was working tirelessly for our people. And then he literally showed me a picture of Kim Jong Il. He's like. Look at that picture, he's the fattest guy in the picture. How can he be possibly starving? But as somebody who in that group think, in that brainwashing, I was not able to see that he was fat. Somebody had to teach me that he was fat. And exactly like in Chicago right now, these people cannot see that I'm the victim, that I'm the one who's beaten up, I'm the one who's taking the wallet away from me. They are just seeing, believing this ideology where oh, they are the oppressed and you are the oppressor here. And I think that's the real danger of groupthink because you cannot see the obvious truth. You really can believe that, you know, Kim Jong-un can read your mind. That absurdity is possible when humans join this group thinking. Anybody who speaks out um, eventually accrues critics. Of course. Um, <laughs> so... In the course of you telling your story, you know, you, I'm sure you've encountered critics, people um, who have said that, you know, the, they don't believe parts of your story or they think your story is inconsistent. How have you dealt with that? And how do you respond to, uh, to, to critics when you come across them? So there's a two different ones. So one critic was before I wrote my first book, mm -hmm. In Order to Live. And the one critic is now who is activated because they think I'm the darling of the Fox News, you know. <laughs> So let's talk about the first critic before the book. There was some of the logic because my English was really not good at the time. I literally learned English watching Friends, the TV show <laughs> in South Korea. I watched the season one to 10 for 30 times. Like, you know, 240 episodes of Friends, you get English eventually, but not that great. Uh, when I was describing that I ate grass initially, 
I, I used to look the word poor in Korea, and the English word came out grass. Later, I understood Nyangswa is a plant. I did not eat grass like horse, I ate the plants. And when I escaping the, through that track of the mountain that I went through, they went to the Google Earth and checked the altitude that I climbed. For me, I was 13 years old. I was like, I'm not like 80 pounds. I was like 50 pounds at the time. I thought it was a mountain. But according to clear science, it's technically a hill. It's not a mountain. I don't know what altitude you decide to be a hill or mountain. <laughs> they decide that. The third part was very logical was, I was writing this book, uh, 19, 20 years old in South Korea. And I don't know how many of you have been to South Korea or Asian countries. It's a very conservative country. And if I said that I was a sex slave for two years of my life, uh, no normal guy would marry me. Because in Korea, I say virginity is very important. So I wanted to have family. As you can see, I'm a mother. That's my, my dream was being a mom. And I really, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I did lie initially that I didn't get raped. My parents protect me. But by the time when I was writing the book, I didn't realize without the full truth, my story cannot have any power. So I wrote everything in the book. So that part is gone after the book. There's not even one person ever challenged. And Penguin on the house is not stupid. They sent the legal team and my co-author, and they interviewed the women who escaped the desert with me, grew up in North Korea. They had the voice recordings of these people because they might re like misremember later, 10 years later. So we still have those recordings of these people. Now the people who are criticizing me, they think that somehow uh, I'm a CIA spy. They think I am taking money from the US government to spread anti, you know, capital, uh, the socialist uh, propaganda. And I was literally canceled by FBI. I was invited to speak last year at FBI in Dallas or Houston. Two days before my event, the head of diversity calls me. Because of your political opinions, we cannot have you as a speaker. And the funny thing was, I became American last year, and in my citizenship interview, this lady asked me, have you ever persecuted anybody for their, their political opinion? If I said yes, I could not become American. So FBI, they need to give their citizenship back to America. They don't even know. Yes. They don't even know what it means to be American because they never took the citizenship. They never earned this freedom. They were born, they're given to it, and they're abusing their, their freedom right now. So right now, all this criticism, I don't even engage it because, I mean, I hope CIA calls me and gave my feedback on their policy, but they, they never call me. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I don't even know how to engage on that level. Yeah. We're just about out of time, but I have uh, one final question from one of our audience members that I want to ask you. Uh, what is your American dream? Uh, you know, it initially was freedom. Like, I thought of freedom as a, as a young girl. I could wear earrings. <laughs> I can dye my hair. I can watch any movie I want. I can marry anybody I want. But... I view freedom a bit differently now after living here some time. I think freedom without virtue, it's anarchy. Freedom requires the responsibility that comes with it. And so many people understand freedom as something, whatever you can do, whatever you want to do. You can shooting up yourself with the hair on the street, smoking pot right next to children, you know, somehow they think that's freedom. And that's why I came to the Bible. That's why I sent my son to Catholic school and go to church because we need that virtue. And we have tried to fill that void of the morality and virtue with the government, the work religion, anything. It seems it doesn't fill us with the good things eventually. And I go back to everybody else did before came to me on this earth, going back to scripture, 
and try to find that moral compass myself. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you to Yonmi Park uh, for an incredible presentation this evening. We're so grateful for you for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at actin.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Eric Cohn.